welcome to today's conversation with Lyman Porter and Benjamin Schneider. I'm Frederick Morgison, the editor of the Annual Review of Organizational Psychology and Organizational Behavior. Before I get to our conversation, I wanted to give you a little bit of background about the, this new journal and how we got to here today to this conversation. Um, Annual Reviews is a nonprofit scientific publisher that publishes over 40 volumes on, from various uh, disciplines in the sciences, including the Annual Review of Psychology. And so for the last 40, 50 years or so, uh, industrial organizational psychology has been represented in the Annual Review of Psychology with a uh, series of, of articles every year, a handful of articles every year. And about three years ago, we decided to start a new volume dedicated exclusively to the fields of industrial and organizational psychology, human resource management, and organizational behavior, hence our somewhat long, probably the longest annual review title uh, that we have. It's kind of awkward, and we'll probably talk a little bit about that during our conversation today. Uh, the goal of this series is to every year publish 20 or 30 articles uh, on various topics in, in the field of organizational psychology and organizational behavior uh, by identifying and recruiting the leading scholars in those domains. Uh, in addition to the reviews of the scholarly literature, we also um, have one article every year that's sort of autobiographical in nature where we ask eminent scientists to sort of reflect upon their careers, reflect upon the field. And this year we're extremely fortunate to have uh, an article by uh, written by Port and Ben that sort of summarizes what the field's been, uh, where it's at currently, and where it might go in the future. And so we're, it's, our, it's our good fortune to have them uh, write the article, but then also be here today. These are two individuals that probably need no introduction. Um, if, if you could have done it, or you could have won it in our field, they did it, and they've won it. Um, they're former presidents of our societies, chairs of our divisions, have won every scientific achievement award you can quite imagine and we're just so grateful to have them here today. So thanks and from today, Ben and Port, and, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we would start today first by sort of just getting a sense of what got you interested in this field of what wasn't named org psych or org behavior when you started, but, but what got you interested in it? So Fred, if you can tell me what this field is, then I could answer the question. I mean, seriously, in terms of, yeah. I mean, what are the discussions that I think your editorial board and certainly Ben and I had about, about how to label the field since there are all these different labels floating around. But to answer the general aspect of your question, I, I got in the field sort of accidentally in graduate school working with a, a, a well-known professor at the time at, at Yale, uh, Carl Hovland. And, uh, he was interested in the organizational aspects of, of psychology and that sort of intrigued me and that's sort of inspired me to think about that as an area to, to go into. I was really, <clears throat> at that time, in experiment, general experimental psychology, but as I thought more about the field and talked to, uh, to Carl and others, I decided areas dealing with organizations is what I was interested in. Okay, great. Ben? Yeah, I mean, it started for me actually in undergraduate school. I was a, a joint psychology and business major. And then, I mean, I didn't know anything about industrial psychology, but one of the classes that you could take was called industrial psychology. And uh, I've often thought of myself as someone who was not a particularly good student or and so forth and so on until I found this thing. And I, I just got interested in it, and I went and got a... I went and got an MBA after I got out of undergraduate school. And then I went into the Army for a couple of years and then decided that I didn't like taking orders so much and that maybe if I went and got a PhD and yeah. so forth, I'd be in a better position. To give orders. To give orders. <laughs> and so, I, I mean, I did it. And actually, when I got my PhD, I wasn't sure whether or not I wanted to go academic or go into practice, and that's one of the great things about our field, of course, is that we, we offer these kinds of options to people, and I, I've always thought that the, the greatest thing about our field is that it's difficult to define, so it leads lo leaves lots of options for areas in yeah. which to do work. Yeah, yeah. And so as you think about it, kind of reflect back on your careers, what, you know, if you can think of other sort of key events, key people, in your personal or professional lives that 
you know, sort of impacted sort of your journey through your career? Well, for me, the, <clears throat> certainly in the, my early career stages was the fact that when I was my final year at Yale get, getting my PhD degree in the middle 50s and I needed a job when I got out and I wasn't sure whether I was going to go into some industrial job or academic job. I was, <clears throat> as I always told my wife, very flexible and thought about different things, possibilities, but turned out that, that Berkeley had an opening for somebody in at that time called industrial social psychology and that exactly the way they labeled it suited my interests, so I applied for the job and unfortunately ended up getting the job. So that was started my career off at a good place in the field. And it's okay, good. Ben, anybody, any people, any kind of events happen for you? Well, one of the most important people in my career is uh, sitting right here, Port. Uh, it's it's a series of happenstances. That, that got us to meet each other. And I was, I was actually talking with my grandson yesterday. He's about to go to college, so he's interested, you know, how do careers unfold and all this. Stuff. I said, well, I'm gonna have a chat with this guy who's been really important. So I'm gonna tell the story and, and we'll see where it goes. So I was a uh, PhD student at University of Maryland. And this must be like 1966. It was. 1966. We, we used to invite people in for these brown bags and stuff like that. So Port was on sabbatical at Yale at the time. And my mentor, Jack Bartlett, invited Port to come to the campus to, to do a, a colloquium. And I volunteered to go pick him up at the airport. So that's how we first met. So I drove him to the campus, then drove him back to the airport. And then about 10 years later, I was looking for an opportunity to have a sabbatical since I'd moved and I lost my sabbatical. Huh? So I applied for a Fulbright. I applied for a Fulbright to Israel and I needed letters to accompany it. So I wrote to Port and I asked him if he would write a letter. It turns out that the head of the industrial psychology program at bar -Ilan University was a former student of Porter's. <laughs> so. So Port writes, lo and behold, I get a Fulbright. So we've had this, I've sort of had him as a kind of a role model. You know, you talked about us becoming, you know, the president of this and the chair of that. He, he did it first, I tried to do it second. So it's just been a wonderful uh, role. Well, I just uh, follow up on the question, uh, too. The, you know, talk about mentors. A lot of people have mentors when they're graduate students, so they sure. have their PhD yeah. advisor and so forth. But for me, two critical mentors were actually colleagues on the faculty when mm -hmm. I went to Berkeley, uh, two senior people at that time. Well, I was as junior as you could possibly be, uh, Ed Gazzelli and, and Mason Hare. And, and just going to lunch with them and talking about different things in the field really gave me all sorts of insights I didn't have. And, and I always remember when I go to lunch with them and I'd say, have you, have you, are you familiar with the research of such and such? They say, oh yeah, I went to graduate school with him. I was in the Air Force with him. I, I, you know, I mean, sure. I thought, gee, am I ever gonna know anybody in the field? I, I don't know anybody in the field. These are just <laughs> names to me. Right. And they're saying, oh, I had all these differences. Anyway, so uh, it's, it's easy to start out humble in the field, I'll say that. But, but one, of the, one of the great things I think about our field is the nature of the relationships that evolve over time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I used to tell my graduate students that they made a wonderful choice just deciding to get a PhD in something like this. Right. Not only for what it represents, but the kind of people who go into the, mm -hmm. our field are, are A, interesting, B, warm, see supportive, you know, reinforcing and all of that right. kind of bit. And, and fairly think, bright. Well, yeah, most. Oh, bright. <laughs> no, no, I no. mean, it's, it, it, it really is a, a wonderful happenstance. I know I keep using that word, but, but to encounter all of these amazing people 
that that we get to work yeah. with. Yeah, and so I, I think the idea of sort of you know fortuitous events is is an interesting one. Kind of the, the flip side of that to me is, is the obstacles one might face as one kind of pursues a career in, in any career, I suppose. But can, can you think of any like major sort of challenges or obstacles that you've encountered in your career that you've either had to work around that prevented you from doing something you wanted to do, or in the end, the, the obstacle produced kind of new, unusual insight that was actually beneficial? Any, any sort of reflections about that? I, I think. One generic sort of obstacle, not unique to, to me in my situation at that time when I started at Berkeley or anything, but, but generally facing uh, younger people starting in the field is sort of choosing problems to work on because you become acutely aware that you only have a finite amount of time and energy and even though you're interested in all sorts of things, there's the reason so you get into the field because you find all these different topics interesting. But in terms of doing research and scholarship, you gotta set some priorities or make some choices, and and that that's a I think a, a challenging task for uh, right. especially for a young faculty member. Uh, sure, yeah. And, uh, I mean, the biggest thing for me as a as a young faculty member was making similar kinds of choices to what Port's talking about. It was um, you get interested in like this big question, right? right. And you wanna you wanna have find some answers to these big questions. But those big questions require, you know, three, five, six years. You know, you always figure you can get a study done in three months, right? You can't. And so <laughs> balancing off right. the, the magnitude versus the doability yeah. of projects, yeah. I think was the big, biggest challenge that I confronted. Because, because you know this publish or perish thing for especially you know for academics yeah. it's a re it's a reality that you need to grapple with right and and i think making choices to make sure that you grapple effective grapple effectively both short term and long term is yeah. is an issue oh, i was just going to say an, an analogy that i used thought of back then when i was trying to decide you know, which topics to work on and research on is it's sort of the, what I call the stove analogy. You have mm -hmm. some front burners and back burners on the stove, and on oh, the front good. burner you have some article that you've invested a lot in, you've got the results, and now it's just a matter of translating that, right. writing it up, just, and, and see if you can get it published. But you can't spend all your total energy on that and have nothing in the back burners ready right. to go from the colder right. burners right. to the hotter burners. So right. I was sort of sort of keeping some uh, array of, of between cold front and back burners. Yeah, sort yeah. of a kind of a pipeline of, of research uh, obviously is real yeah. important. So I'm curious too, so you guys have both had long, very successful careers and a lot of times we can give advice to junior faculty, but I think as one goes on in one's career, maybe it's challenging, how do you maintain that kind of motivation and maintain sort of that productivity that gets you not just tenured or promoted, but but that gets you into sort of the sort of upper echelon of, of scholars or, or people in your field. And so how, how have you been able to maintain your motivation, you know, still a, a real sort of vital and, and active and over a long period of time? Well, I mean, I've just been lucky that the stuff I work on is really, really interesting to me, and I, I keep perseverating on, on similar topics, adding occasional mm -hmm. new, new, new topics. But the, I think the challenge is to find, is to luck into, you know, that which just continuously you know, drives your thought processes and yeah. seeking opportunities to further study. And for me, it was this organizational climate and culture. I think it's the topic is vague enough mm -hmm. so that you never resolve it. <laughs> so I just keep looking for other avenues to uh, nooks and crannies. And so how did you luck into that topic? What was your what was your entree into that? What was the climate like? <laughs> Well, I mentioned earlier my, my mentor, Jack Bartlett. So he, he was trained in educational measurement and statistics at Ohio State University, 
which is the way most industrial psychologists were trained at the time, right? Individual differences. So uh, stat, statistics, and quantitative approaches were never m exactly my strong suit, let's say. So in contrast to everyone else in the, IOC, the industrial psychology program at the time, my second specialty, remember you used to have second specialties, not just the primary, but a second. So mine was social psychology. And so we would have these, these discussions about you know, what my dissertation was going to be and what's important. And I always ended up saying, well, you know, the situation is important. And he'd always say, yeah, but it's the individual differences that matter. And so we actually did some work together. Mm -hmm. and, and I did the context thing, and I needed a label mm. for what the situation was. And I read a couple of articles. They used the word climate. That, that was, was that. it. It was a very deep conceptual thought, as you can tell. <laughs> and also sort of uh, foreshadowed your interactional psychology yeah, work, yeah, right? Yeah. The idea of resolving those two sort of tensions, the individual differences yeah, in, that's, in the context. That, that was the beginning of that thought process. You're yeah. right, Fred. And I know, Port, you're real interested in context, too, and have some thoughts about sort of Maybe we've neglected context a little well, bit in the field. Well, over the years, I've become more and more convinced that, that up to now at least, the, our, our field, however we are labeling the field uh, in our several different labels we sure. have, is that uh, those of us that started out more in the micro side or the uh, sort of I.O. side uh, have not put enough emphasis on what I call the big O, the organizational right. context. And, and it's not that there's been zero uh, attention to that, but just, I mean, to me, the fascinating thing in the field is, is organizations are just, if you go to McDonald's, it's interesting to see how the organization operates. If you fly on American Airlines, how, does, how do people coordinate? If you watch Bloomberg News or something, how do they do the job? You know? and, yeah. and, and so watching these different, uh, kinds of uh, organizations try to put together human effort is, is what is continually sort of fascinated me. Yeah. And, uh, well, I could add something that Port wouldn't say himself, but I remember I was, I was a graduate student, remember, when we first met, and I read an annual review. A nameless review, one. <laughs> an annual review article that he wrote in 1966 on, what was the title of it? Personnel something? Yeah, I think they call, gave me personnel management. Personnel management, something like that. And that's exactly what he said in 1966. He says, you know, I'm going to tell you about what's going on, but let me tell you about what should be going on. And, and in that article, he said, you know, we need to pay more attention to the context and the organizational issues and so forth and so forth. So he, he's been a proponent of this forever. And so it's, in, it's interesting kind of sociologically from the center of our, our science is, you know, to the extent that we've, I think we've done a little bit of work in that area, but probably not enough. I mean, what would you think, what would you sort of re think the reason why we've not really done more uh, on context? Well, partly it's back to this issue of the sort of I.O. psychology emphasis on individual differences. And you have sociology interested in big macro view of organizations, but the interconnections of the individual differences, micro and the macro, has not received the same degree. Of course, in a way, that's parts of the field that we call organizational behavior, which introduces another term we haven't really got here. Right. It's affected, uh, it's helped put some emphasis on trying to connect the, big, the macro and the micro. And the, yeah, I think, I think the it's due to the history of the field. Yeah. So the early history was all on individual differences, and we were phenomenally successful in the personnel selection that we did mm -hmm. early on. Mm -hmm. And then I think World War II, with, with you know, the, especially in what was then the Army Air Corps, but became the Air Force, the selection that we did of pilots turned out to be remarkably effective. Right. And and the the people who worked on those processes during World War II then went into business and industry, mm -hmm. and they sold the idea 
that, right. hey, you know, we can do a better job of hiring who we hire. Right. And they had evidence to show it. And, and I think that's the other piece. Mm -hmm. That, that, in, that uh, emphasis on individual differences always was accompanied by an emphasis on validity. Mm -hmm. Not just measure it, but demonstrate that what you're measuring really works. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that has helped us become a valued field in business and industry, right. but but we needed to keep going, but, and yeah, do but. other stuff, and I mean half the field is still involved in personnel selection. Right. Half the field of IO psychology. Yeah, yeah. You know. And so then organizational psychology sort of emerges, sort of out of this, um, and to my read, sort of has sort of become the predominant sort of focus now. If you talk to graduate students, a lot of them want to deal in sort of organizational psychology or organizational behavior kinds of topics, the, the more groups, the more leadership kind of stuff, which maybe is the natural evolution. Maybe it's that we've just learned what, what there is to learn on the, the individual differences side, and now there's more interesting topics. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I was going to turn the tables and ask you a question on that. That's <laughs> well, do you're, it. You're, no, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> You're a psychologist in the in the business school, right? In right, the management yeah. department. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I'm an undergraduate has taken if not your course, some other similar course. So I'm coming in to you and asking for advice and say, uh, Dr. Morrison, I wanna I'm interested in this general area. Should I go to a, a psychology get my PhD in, in organizational psychology or should I go into a business school and get my PhD in organizational behavior yeah and what how would you advise me yeah it's an interesting question I would probably need to know more about the extent to which you know you were interested in kind of the psychological phenomenon versus other sorts of phenomenon what I think is an interesting sort of tension in the field right now is where where do people go to get their graduate education what kind of graduate education does that involved so having a degree for me in, in psychology but then being in a business school you see the differences in how people are trained uh, and it is it is a difference in training and I think people end up in, in different paths I think in a business school you're much less likely to go into sort of the real micro human resource management industrial psychology domain you're much more oh, likely to go into the yeah. organizational uh, side I think our students tend to be very organizationally focused OB focused um, and I, I think that they probably just suspect that there's more to do there and there's more possibilities for publishing in our top journals. Yeah, yeah but we're, we're still maintaining that dichotomy, though. We're, 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 not, we're not pushing together the individual attributes with the, with the contextual attributes. Right. Be, be, and, it, and there's absolutely no doubt in my mind, which means I'm probably wrong, <laughs> that that's where the future is. Yeah. Is be, because yeah. if if we lose sight of the people attributes, then organizations are are like structure and function and levels of hierarchy and mm -hmm. stuff like that, mm -hmm. which is which loses sight of of who the yeah. people are, and I, I I think we need to push them together, rather than ask which direction do you want to go. Yeah, and so it's an interesting, I think we've done this in both sides. On the psychology side, you study industrial psychology or organizational psychology. If you go into business school, you either study human resource management or organizational behavior. And there's these really distinctive lines, at yeah. least uh, in a lot of graduate programs. Yeah. You either specialize in one or the other. Your yeah. comprehensive exams are one or the other. Your dissertation is one or the other. And so... You know, one of the things we're trying to do with this series is to say that both of those are valuable and we're going to look at both and it's kind of reflected in the title of the series. But what, what can we do as a field to help emphasize this fact that it's not one or the other. You have to understand both, utilize both, because it helps explain phenomenon in a better way. It also depends on what you want to do with both. I mean, people in human resources if they get a degree in that, certainly have an opportunity yeah. to work in, in organizations and not just go into academia. Right. Whereas somebody, for example, getting a PhD in organizational behavior has a hard time going out and selling themselves to work in a, in a company or organization and say, I'm going to be an organizational behaviorist. Yeah. So the, the OB side tends to 
channel you more towards the academic jobs. And, and, and therefore that's in a way self-perpetuating. Perpetuating. I, I always I like to say that there's a department of HR, but there is no department of OB in most organizations. And so uh, if you're going to work in an organization, you tend to get funneled, like you say, through kind right. of the HR sort of aspect of it. But I mean, what do you, what do you think we can do um, uh, to, you know, sort of acknowledge the value of both? Well, to, I'd like to answer, or not answer it, but pose another question related to that. Okay. You two are both on the editorial board of this new journal that's coming out, this new volume of annual reviews. Can you talk a little bit about the, how you came out with the decision of how to title the, the article or the chapter? I mean, the, the, I'm sorry, the, the volume. The series, yeah. The so series, so yes. we, had, we had a long conversation. Right I can tell you the original title was the Annual Review of Industrial and Organizational Psychology. And because that's the discipline that comes out of psychology. This volume's born out of the interview of psychology, and so it made perfect right. sense. We got together, and I think it was Ben that kind of brought up this idea that, you know what, there's this, this whole other domain that's clearly related, but it's, it doesn't arise out of psychology, it arises out of business schools, and, and they call it OB, and they call it human resource management. And so we had a long discussion, iterated through many different versions of a title. I mean, probably ideally we'd be the interview, annual review of industrial, an organizational uh, psychology, human resource management, and organizational behavior. Boy, that's pithy. That would be <laughs> create quite the acronym for us. And so we arrived at this somewhat uh, <laughs> convoluted organizational psychology that captures, we think, the I.O. side, and then organizational behavior, which sort of captures the H.R. and the O.B. side. So, Ben, do you have any sort of uh, observations or reflections of sort of our discussion around uh, naming this uh, this series? By R, you mean the, the editorial board? Editorial committee, yeah. Editorial. Yeah. No, I thought you did a really good job of describing the the process. What, what was really cool was the various positions that people seem to take mm -hmm. uh, on this as it unfolded, and it's probably similar to what happened when PSYOP went from the Division of Industrial Psychology to the Division of Industrial and Organizational Psychology, and eventually PSYOP. So maybe, Port, you, you were involved in that. Yeah, that, the, the way we got our current name, we on in the PSYOP side got the name Society of Industrial Organizational Psychology was a, a change from the earlier name of, of uh, Society of Industrial Psychology. In the early 70s, the executive committee had a discussion of this, uh, and some of us raised the question, shouldn't we change the name of the uh, division? At that time, there wasn't a society, and it was still a division of APA, uh, and it was Division 14. And should we change it from industrial psychology to organizational psychology? And the, the executive committee at that particular time, in around 73, was really split. Some people thought yes, and others thought no. As being psychologists, you can imagine there was not unanimity on anything. But uh, <laughs> so finally, the idea was well, let's call it Society or Division of Industrial and Organizational Psychology as a compromise, even though half the people didn't like the fact it said organizational, and the other half didn't like the fact it still had industrial in there. But ever since, it's been, you know, industrial organizational psychology. So it was, I.O. is strictly a comp compromise term, as it turns out. And, and so that's not the definition of, like, a good compromise is everyone hates it, right? right. So that's the, uh, yeah, that, that, that's the solution. What do you make of sort of PSYOP's recent, uh, a few years ago, they had this initiative to maybe change the name from PSYOP, I think it was to the Society of Organizational Psychology, or SOP or SOP, and... I think it, it it didn't pass, but by ver a very narrow margin. What's your kind yeah, of take well, on you can, the you can see how people are still split on that issue. Because I was talking about 73 when the uh, executive committee made his ticket to the membership to change it from I psychology to I.O. psychology. So here in, you know, a few, as you say, a few years ago, 2009 or something like that, the, the, the motion or the ballot proposal to change it to uh, just organizational uh, failed by nine votes or something like that. So so clearly, the way people look at the field in that terms, are, uh, that the proportions haven't yeah. changed a lot. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, when you think about sort of uh, the field as a whole, I think one of the other things that's, uh, that is char it's characterized by, and I think, you, Ben, you touched on a little earlier, is this idea of the publisher parish kind of model and that there's this strong emphasis on publishing research in our sort of top tier journals. What, what are your thoughts about that as, a, as sort of a model for how our science works? Is that something that you think is, is generally good? Does it produce any kind of uh, sort of negative or bad outcomes from that kind of focus? I think it has several negative consequences, but there's no better model that I've been able to find. So it's sort of like they say about, you know, the U.S. and the way that Congress works and all of that, you know, it's really terrible and they never do anything. And so, but th there isn't a better system. So, so the, well, maybe it's because it's a compromise as well, mm -hmm. right? I mean, like I see on the net, on the internet, all these journals that are starting up, you know, just on the internet, and it's open, you know, submission, and yeah. But but I think we have to have some some evaluation, relatively independent, mm -hmm. and I emphasize the relatively, in order to screen out the the articles that don't meet accepted contemporary standards for what research should be. Mm -hmm. And so is it wonderful? No, but I, I haven't seen or heard about a better system yet. Well, also, it's, it's certainly that specific to our field. I mean, right, the, right. all of academia areas right. are facing these questions of about yeah. increasing pressures to publish at a limited number of top so-called top-tier journals and so forth. So oh. I don't think in, in organizational psychology, organization, we hit, we're any different than other areas mm -hmm. of academia on that score. Uh, and just to follow, I think the major problem in my head is that if you don't find statistically significant results, it doesn't get published. Right. And, and I think that if I was the editor of a journal as you are the editor, or were the editor, I would try and find papers that were conceptually rich, that tested theoretical ideas that everyone, not everyone, but most people would agree are true, right. and, and then did not find support. Right. And, and I think that I personally have the shortest results section of any article ever published in the Journal of Applied Psychology. So my results section is, oh, it didn't work. <laughs> you know, it's a paragraph about that long. And it got published. And it got published. But because it was something that everyone believed what was the way things would work out, and I had published an earlier paper where that was the, the hypothesis that I made, and I got the day and it didn't work out. So Do you, do you I, think that I, article would get published today? No. And, and why not? What's, what's changed? Um, I, I, I think everyone would find a pro, prob, sufficient problems with the way the article right. got done right. to say, no, this can't be true. The flaws in the study's yeah. design. And, and every study has yeah. flaws uh, that have been multiply pointed out to me when I submit articles. So. Yeah, and so that's an interesting thing. I think one of the one of the things you see in some of the other domains, and I think you, you've seen a little bit in our field, but this idea of, because we have this sort of peer review system that is somewhat relies on people being sort of honest and genuine in terms of how they did the research and 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 their analyses and so forth. And you've seen some scandals, I think in social psychology in particular, people making up data or yeah. manipulating data. Uh, do, you, do you think that's a problem in our field? Do you see that as, a, as something that we're going to have to address going forward? Well, there, there's this big exchange on the yeah. on the we web sites right now, these listservs and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, about the very issue. In reading these, one could reach the conclusion that this is a larger problem now than it ever has been before. Okay. And I think that's totally false. Uh, I think it's always been an issue people in various fields, you know, like Port was saying, it's not just our field, people in various fields 
for some reason or other, you know, make these really bad decisions uh, uh, about their data and about, you know, coming up with the theory after the data and so da, 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 da. So that's, that's not new, and the problem will always exist. There's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, the potential's always been there. I, I'm not clear about why it's suddenly coming up now in so much uh, focus. I mean, when yeah. it's, not, it's not like the world just invented those problems. Yeah, I think it's coming up because there were these, I forget what the research was, but it was in, in a medical research. Right, it was a medical research. And, uh, and the conclusions that were reached were based on either false data or made up data or something like that, and it had life and death consequences. And so that stimulates the issue, well, how, but, how much of this stuff is really going but on? But nobody could think that before, before that problem, that particular article problem came, who would think that this could never happen? You'd have to be really naive to say, oh, I, would, I was so shocked at this. I, I couldn't agree with you more, and that's what I'm saying. I don't think this is a new... Yeah, it's not yeah. a new phenomenon. It's maybe not the a pressures, new phenomenon. Maybe the pressures for publishing I, I, kind of pushed it to the fore where grant monies and promotions and stuff are contingent upon. I think a bigger yeah. issue is mm -hmm. you're the uh, uh, journal editor look from that perspective, but you've got increasing sizes of faculty and more people in the field squeezing through this little narrow funnel of, right. of highly uh, specified top journals. And it's a, it's a lot of good research not getting published or uh, visible because, because you can only get so many articles in a few yeah. top journals or not. Or how do we deal with that issue, I guess? Yeah, it's an interesting one because there has been work looked at the number of faculty have increased, but the number of pages sort of allotted haven't sort of kept yeah. pace with the number of people trying to do the research, and perhaps that's one of the issues. Um, kind of building off of that idea, that it is clear that many of the top journals have very high rejection rates, 90-plus uh, percent rejection rates. And, and I'm wondering, both of you have been very successful scholars over the course of your careers. Did you find that it got easier to publish for you as you went on in your career? Or did it always kind of stay challenging, or did the challenges change? What are your thoughts about that? Always challenging. How come? Well, I, I didn't change to answer for yeah. me at least. I didn't find any difference later versus earlier. Okay. But I, I think in the last ten years, for sure, maybe it's fifteen years, that there has been an enormous increase in the in the conceptual and theoretical requirements to get yeah. an article published. So, so when I first started publishing, you know, as, as an extreme example, there was the validity information exchange mm -hmm. in personnel psychology. Right. You, you know, you did a project, you got some results that might be useful to other people, and you published yeah. them. Yeah. So uh, my perception, and maybe it's because I, you know, for the last 10 years I've been working in the world of consulting, my perception is that interesting results are no longer interesting to journals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that's really bad because you, you don't have to have solved the, the problem of nature versus nurture, you know, right. in order to get an article published. And you don't have to have 37 pages of, of theoretical background to show this piece of interesting data. And I think we've gone way overboard on the theoretical side. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think, as uh, others, Ed Locke and others, I, we need to, I, I, I think, be much more emphasis on inductive. Uh, yeah. And, and, I just agree, yeah, the way I sec I, I just it, agree yeah. with what Ben just said. Yeah, I mean, the way I think of it is science progresses in a lot of different ways, through deductive right. means, through and, inductive right, means. Right, both. It's, and not one is necessarily exactly so. more important than the other, if but anything, the field the, has the, the emphasis should be on to, the interplay. You know, yeah, and, sure. And well, inductive. then I think the interaction component, I think, is also important. What advice would you give to, I think the challenge uh, for people that are established in the field is different than the challenge for people that are coming into the field, either as graduate students or as new faculty. So what advice would you give those people as, as they're sort of navigating this process of 
you know, this, this theoretical contribution, this much more competition for that space. Uh, what, what sort of lessons have you learned, I think, in, in, in your own professional academic publishing careers that, uh, that you think people might find helpful? Well, <laughs> I mean, uh, the, the most important lesson that you have to learn about getting published is you have to write. I mean, I, 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 I saw and I continue to see many, many bright people who do really interesting studies and they never write them up because writing is tough work. And so maybe 15 or 20 years ago, I came up with this phrase, write, 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 morning, noon, and night. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you're not writing, you can't publish. Right. And so that's, that's the most important thing. I think it, you have to actually sit down and do the writing. And the second thing is you have to have a model in your head as to what kinds of articles you want to emulate. Mm. And therefore, you have to read the, the literature. Right. Right. You, you have to know the kinds of articles that are getting published. Not that you have to mimic them, but, right. but you have to understand what the... So what is that like how how they're structured, kind yeah, of how they build you, their arguments, how they present their results? Precisely. Sort of yeah. You got to learn to say up front what the article is about and why you think it's important. And right. I mean, there's just like sort of a map. Maybe that's the way to think about it. And then the third thing is you got to have someone as your Jiminy Cricket. You know, what would he sh he or she say if they saw this article? Mm -hmm. And, and you, you need to pick someone who, who you value and whose standards you admire and so forth. And is critical, willing to be critical, right? Yeah, yeah. and they don't even have to be there. You just have to say, well, what would... What, right, you know? oh, sort of and as, I, as a, I used as a device, to say, yeah. I used to say, when I f first started out, I used, I used to say, uh, well, what would Pat Smith say if she saw this, you know? Yeah. And, and I think those three things. Yeah. Yeah, uh, just... Nothing substitutes for persistence. Sure. But I, I've, you know, for beginning graduate students particularly, uh, I found over the years, this is, this is a generalization, so obviously plenty of right. individual exceptions to any right. generalization like this, but, but I found a lot of, uh, of graduate students in the early couple of years were very clear about what topic they were interested in. They really were interested in X or they were interested right, in right. Y, and, and they could articulate. Sure why they were interested in it. But then to get them to formulate a researchable question related to that topic right. was really the hard thing. And, 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 then, and then to get them to think about, okay, yeah. if you did that study and you found some results, would anybody pay attention to it? Would it mean, have any meaning to other people? Right. It's right. clear that you could carry out the study and you might get it published if you write it well enough. But would anybody... Yeah. Re care whether I mean yeah. it does it matter yeah. so to get them to, to convert interests into actual contributions so to speak is, was, is a, 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 what, what, how would one do that what's the what's the sort of device how what will we tell people that you know it's great to have an idea but how do you translate that idea into something that other people care about what would be what's the maybe there is no secret but what are some of the things you'd be looking for to do that don't do another study of which there are 700 already because people yeah. are interested in another job satisfaction turnover study, right? So it's, right. it's, it's that kind of... So look for the novel. You, 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 yeah. you want to you look for the important novel. Yeah. And, and yeah. This, this is another issue, I think, that we're fortunate in IO psychology in particular that, that the world of practice is not seen as a negative in, in IO psychology, mm -hmm. and we can discover what are important problems just by being out there working with companies. Uh, and so I think that's, a, that's one route yeah. to, to, to resolving that problem. Right. Yeah, I think another is, is, as you mentioned, is kind of know the literature. So in the sense of knowing what's been done clarifies what is the next sort of step beyond What's been done? But again, to challenge students to answer that question: yeah. How does this advance the literature from what yeah. is there now? To yeah. and would would people care if you made that kind of you know? It, it, 
Yeah, so I want to pick up on two things that you said, and we'll t talk with the first thing you said, Port, this idea of persistence. And so, is, is in your mind, is persistence like an individual difference a person has? Is persistence um, something that, that the environment or the context can help shape? How does one who's going into the field who may not be the most persistent person in the world, we know that persistence matters or resilience matters and in the face of a lot of negative feedback. I mean, what does one do to, to develop that or to, to, to have that, to, to be successful in this endeavor? One is not to go into the field if you don't have it. <laughs> so that's a, that's a selection <laughs> issue, right? So what's the difference yeah, matter? No, I, right? I, mean, I agree with Port. I, I think uh, it's, it's highly correlated with individual difference. I think, yeah. of course, there, there are contextual things. I, I would never argue against the importance of context. The I mean, I think that people can change. They can, to some extent, raise their persistence levels, I suppose. Right. And, uh, but, but I think they have to think about whether they want to be persistent or not. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of people say, well, yeah, I agree, persistence is a good thing, but I don't want to put that effort into me. You know, right. I, want I want to go somewhere yeah. where I don't have to be sort of persist so against a lot yeah, of negative right. uh, feedback. Uh, and that's yeah. fine. That's sure. people's choices. Sure. Yeah, I think, I think it's a persistence slash delay of gratification mm -hmm. issue. Mm-hmm. I, I recently um, was listening to NPR, and they they told about you, you remember these studies that were done with the marshmallow. Mm -hmm. You remember the delay the, gratification, the, the delay stuff, of gratification yeah. studies. Yeah. So there was a happenstantial follow up of some of these kids 16, 18 years later. Yeah, and they could predict SAT scores. Right based on how long the kids waited before they picked up the marshmallow The team. delayers had higher scores. The delayers had higher scores. Yeah. I, I, think, I think that is one of those really interesting individual Well, then again, is that individual differences, or is that because the parents have trained them to, to be more willing to delay? I, I don't care what the source is, nature <laughs> or nurture, but it's an individual difference. I want you to solve nature and nurture. I have never... Oh, you see, it's an interesting finding. I don't care about the big theory. <laughs> so let me let me I get off persistence and go, you, you know, Ben, you have... Don't this, persist. <laughs> I, I won't persist on this particular topic right now. But uh, so you have this idea of right, 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 morning, noon, and night. What sort of tips could you give people or what sort of tools have you used to kind of follow that? sort of um, practice and, and how have you been able to be successful at that? Well, the first one is so obvious to me and that is if you haven't written something today, it's not been a good day. You, you don't have to write all day, mm -hmm. but, but you, you, you have to persist. <laughs> and, and, and you- Make you some progress. You have, to, you have to do it. There's so many other things that are much more fun than struggling right. getting right. words together right. that, that it's easy, well, I'll do it tomorrow. So if, if you skip a day, well, you haven't put a couple of sentences down right. on something, th then it's not good. The second thing is that I, I, even before we had computers, I just made notes all over the place. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'd have a file for this and a file for that, and they'd just be random notes. And then when I was writing, I could I could use yeah. them to organize mm -hmm. what what I what I was trying to do. But it's it's so much easier now, it mechanically, is. so to speak, to do your writing. Not not the not the intellectual part. That's still as challenging as it. But you know. And, Historical footnote: In the old days, when you only had typewriters, you made an error and you had to correct it or erase it or something. I mean, it was just, you know, that just that little dealing with the mechanics of the yeah. situation was discouraging, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So having computers, word processing program, I mean, it's just made it so much more comfortable. To yeah, write. but the, but the young people coming along today, they don't know. They don't know how good they have it, right? No. And we didn't know how good we had it <laughs> when, when we could actually had whiteout. You remember? Yeah, you that know? was a big advance. <laughs> right. that, was, that was our big technological advances. Yeah. You could put whiteout on them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So in, in terms of uh, thinking about sort of your own careers, and, and is there any other sort of advice you would give to people sort of starting out in the field? I, I sort of, there's some things here, you know, persist at it, make sure you write every day, find something you find really interesting and engaging. Other stuff? Well, oh, if I could just make one comment Absolutely. in that area, it's, it's, yeah. I'm not, it's not exactly a direct answer, but you know, one of the things I learned early on is if, if you're fairly successful early in your career, in the academic career I'm talking about and so forth, and you get published and, and so forth in, mm -hmm. in good journals, and the very things that you get recognition for, so to speak, are the very things that create problems in doing that activity, in more follow-up activity, because you get invited to give a talk or colloquial. Well, that takes time away from doing right, the research. Right, you get right. invited to be on this committee or asked to be on this committee because, because of your visibility right, from right. publishing and so forth. And, and the very things that got you successful yeah. are the things that now start interfer interfering right. with your success in that realm if you're not careful. So sure. the thing of, of, of having too many things to do and too many challenges has increased if you so protect maybe one piece of advice is to kind of be be cognizant of be that, cognizant that, that of, problem happens exactly. and then maybe try to somehow sort of protect your writing time or protect your thinking time or your researching time as yeah. these other demands sort of begin to intrude. Yeah, so uh, let me follow up on what Port said. I remember, I remember when that first started to happen and I said to myself, well, how am I gonna handle this? You know, and, and Brenda, my wife said to me, she said, you know, you. You'll, you'll absorb these new things if you just give it, you know, some persistence and, and try them. And in my, for my entire career, I've used that kind of logic to take on more than I thought maybe was smart to take on mm -hmm. because new is always more difficult than what right. you know. But new becomes what you know, mm -hmm. and then you find new and interesting stuff that emerges. Like you know, I mean, like Port. I mean, he he's chaired everything, right? And president of this, that, and the other thing, and continued to write. And, and I've I've been able to do the same thing by getting involved. And the getting involved in the profession is really stimulating not only from the people you meet mm -hmm. but from the new th new challenges you confront right. and, uh, right. that reminds me <laughs> sort of indirect uh, uh, anecdote uh, true <laughs> when i first was on the faculty at berkeley we had uh, faculty mailboxes and the mail would come at like 10 in the morning be delivered there at 10 in the morning and 3 in the afternoon in those days and i would go to the mailbox Nothing there. My colleagues were hauling out three or four letters or something. Finally, after some, I got so desperate, I even liked having advertisements come to my <laughs> mailbox because somebody was sending me something. You know, I wasn't being totally ignored by the right, whole world. Right. And so it was later on, again, as I got somewhat more in the field and you might say more recognizable, then that. What used to be a, a big plus of not getting mail, uh, I mean, big minus not getting mail turned into the opposite. Yeah, I remember when I first came to Michigan State, I think my, my dean didn't know who I was. And at the time, you think, well, I would like my dean to know who I am. And I think uh, he thought I was a graduate student. But then you realize it's great when your dean doesn't know who you are because they can't ask you to do anything. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Yeah, so yeah. so enjoy, enjoy those I, uh, times, I guess. Uh, yeah, in be careful what you ask for. That's right. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a big challenge. Other, other sort of advice or, or sort of lessons that you've learned uh, in, in, uh, in your careers for, for young scholars? Well, I, I just quick what I was always clear from the beginning that I didn't know if I was going to get tenure or, or how I was going to do in the field, but I was always going to reserve time for non-academic activities. Okay like playing touch football or things, yeah, or sure. doing something with my wife on the weekend or something. But I just, I made a, a commitment to myself, so to speak, that I was not going to let the demands of academia overwhelm everything. And mm -hmm. I was going to, even if, mm -hmm. even if I failed in academia, I was not going to do it that way. Sure. 
That really brings up the issues of, of how one defines success. And so it sounds to me like one of the ways you've defined success is, is sort of this combination of kind of the work domain and then the sort of the personal domain. Um, any advice about how one should think about success? Dr. Steiner? <laughs> well, it's the old criterion problem, right, for, for personal lives. I think it's multidimensional, you know, mm. and if it's not, then you're really in trouble. Okay. So, so you need to have, as Port said, you need you need to have these these multiple facets. What's uh, multiple identities? You mm -hmm. need to have multiple identities. Yeah. You know, you're a father, you're a husband or wife, you're a you're an academic, you're a, a consultant, you're a, right. you know an administrator. It, and I think, for, for me, part of the interest in life mm -hmm. is the interest in all of those domains. It's the diversity. It's of, the, it's right. the yeah. diversity. And, and I think you do, have to, you do have to make a commitment in that you have to identify what these issues are, what these identities are that you want to fulfill. Mm -hmm. And, and then a lot of time and, and commitment to those as well. So have you guys found that in your careers, I mean, it sounds to, to me, Port, like you, this was a very sort of deliberative decision at the time. Is this something that you kind of thought about or sort of emerged as, as you made observations about your, your own career? What was the kind of the process through which that? Well, in my case, happened? it was pretty much an intent. Yeah. In other words, I was gonna do some extra curriculum. One thing I did early in my years at Berkeley was, I was a faculty representative of the student government. That was, they proceeded to have the Berkeley riots and everything, so I wasn't quite effective in that, <laughs> that role. But, but, you know, I took it on deliberately. In other words, I realized this was interfering with having additional two hours mm -hmm. or something to do a, a right part of another article, but I, I deliberately wanted to do some different things. Okay. So I did. Yeah. So yeah. it wasn't accidental uh, in my case. And for, for me, I turned down opportunities to have roles that I thought would interfere with other things I wanted mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I was head of the Iowa Psychology Program at Maryland, but I never became chair of the department, and that was a very conscious decision on mm -hmm. my part, that I didn't want to have to take the time to deal with all of those people on, on issues that I thought <laughs> were not going to be interesting to me right. or useful to me in any way. You didn't so like the didn't idea of assigning faculty office space or something I, like I that? I didn't like assigning faculty office space, and mostly I didn't like the idea of having to deal with people I didn't respect. Mm -hmm. and I, I knew that would cause me trouble. Yeah. So I just, I never did it. Yeah. yeah. Right? But, but I think, like, one of the things I remember when, when uh, I first took my the job at Yale was the opportunity to play doubles with Port and, and Chris Argeris and, and other things like that. So I, I, I always maintain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, there's a good example. We were out playing tennis when we could have been writing. Writing. We, but, but again, it has yeah. to have some balance. In that. Yeah. I mean, you can overdo that. You can say, oh, well, I love the tennis. I'm going to play every day for four hours. Yeah, and, and I saw guys do that. Yeah. I saw other faculty do that. Right. Especially but, after they got tenure, and, and that was it was so disappointing mm -hmm. to, to the especially the graduate students right. to see right. these faculty who sort of quit. Yeah, and I think yeah. it's so well, stay engaged and but balanced because it's, it's a marathon in a way, right? I mean, there is I think a a, a, yeah. a very um, sort of you get a lot of benefit out of being successful early, but the reality is, is we the jobs we have we don't wear out in the way you might if you were in a physical, uh, physically demanding right, job, right? right? And so yeah. we have very long careers, potentially. Yeah, and I think actually intellectually, I feel I've become much broader over the years mm -hmm. in the issues I'm willing to simultaneously consider when I think about you know, important problems in organizations and so forth. Yeah. So in the social sciences, that old literature that we knew about, you know, mathematicians mm -hmm. peak at 23 or something, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's not true in, in the social sciences. Yeah, yeah. 
So any other kind of final thoughts about um, sort of if you're going to talk to a, a, an eager graduate student or a young faculty that you might want to impart to them? <laughs> Follow your nose. I mean, it, if it smells right, you know, try it. And that doesn't have to be your final decision or the final place you end up. Right. But it, if if it strikes your fancy, try it. Mm -hmm. be, because you'll be able to persist at it because right. it struck your fancy. Because you're interested in it. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Stay engaged. So just stay engaged in whatever it is. And I guess the way you stay engaged is to find things that are interesting to you. But, yeah. but recognize, I guess, the idea that that, that like, interest can change and evolve over time. And yeah, like, like writing introductory chapters for a new <laughs> volume of annual <laughs> reviews or something. It's a, it's a, and it's a, it's, a, it's a great honor for us to be able to publish that. And I want to thank both of you for not only writing your article for the inaugural volume of the annual review of organizational psychology and organizational behavior, but also coming here uh, today and, and sharing some of your thoughts with us today. So thank you very much. Yeah, it's, yeah, been, it's great been great fun. fun. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Fred. Yeah.